Thank you everyone for coming, especially at this really busy time of the year. I'm so glad you can all be here. For those of you who don't know me, I think I know everyone out there. <laughs> I'm Jody Kovach, the Curator of Academic Programs here at the Gun Gallery. I've been looking forward to ORCID's talk since last fall, when actually probably late last summer, in fact, when we were talking about the Art of Trees exhibition. This is a, a project that she had really been involved in from its genesis as a contributor, as talking, someone who spoke with the student curators and lent her expertise generously. And we were talking about the exhibition and her research um, on gaseous modernities. And Orchid suggested this artist, John Girard, and he was something, someone I hadn't been familiar with at that point. And so I shared this with the associate, the student associate curators who were very, very interested in his work and thought it was important to include it in the exhibition. So our collections manager, Robin Goodman, um, worked some magic and was able to uh, work, uh, work out a plan with the artist to have uh, burning oil fields, the digital simulation that's in the gallery this semester. And so we're really grateful to uh, Orchid Tierney uh, to, uh, for coming in and talking with us about your research in connection to this. Um, Orchid's talk, Planetary Respirations, explores breath, the non-human, and the aesthetics of planetary atmosphere in an effort to understand the question, who can breathe easily in the Anthropocene? Using the work of artist John Gerard, currently on view in The Art of Trees. Orchid Tierney is Assistant Professor of English. Uh, her research focuses on the Anthropocene, waste, and waste management in contemporary experimental poetry. She's the author of A Year of Misreading, Ocean Plastic, Blue Doors, and her scholarship reviews and poetry have appeared in Jacket 2, Fractured Ecologies, and elsewhere. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Orchid. Thank you. Thanks, Jody. I'm just going to share my screen. So just give me one tick. Perfect. Let me just pull this along. Uh, I can't see. Um, can someone just give me a thumbs up if you if you can see that? Or verbal. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. I'm just gonna. Perfect. Well, thank you, um, Jody and Caroline, uh, for organizing uh, this event. I'm really hoping to sort of share with you some ideas relating to plant and planetary breathing. Um, these are ideas over which I'm really grappling with, and I don't know whether I have full comprehension of them, um, but I am hoping that in conversation, I'll be able to make some useful connections, and hopefully you will um, uh, make some useful connections as well. I am going to be taking you on a, a more of a ticket tour uh, around some ideas before I actually get to the um, uh, Jean Girard's uh, work. Before I begin, though, I do want to acknowledge that uh, Kenya College acknowledges that the lands on which we live, work, celebrate, and heal are the ancestral homelands of the Miami, Lenape, Wyandotte, and Shawnee peoples, among others. Uh, the disputed Treaty of Greenville in 1795 and the forced removal of Indigenous peoples from this region allowed for the founding of the college in the early 1800s. As a community, we need to be committed to confronting this dark past while also embracing through education the many Indigenous communities that continue to thrive in Ohio. So I mention this also because I want to begin with a conversation on Indigenous breath. About two hours from where I grew up in Invercargill, Aotearoa, New Zealand, is a large finger lake called Lake Wakatipu. The lake is nested in the southern Alps of to Wai Punamu, the South Island. At its extremes, the body of the lake measures three miles wide and 52 miles long. The surrounding mountains are crystal in the winter, haunting often airy in the evenings when the shoreline wildlife is silent. And for as long as I can remember, Wakatipu has been called the breathing lake. 
Now, I must have read this moniker on a brochure or a travel poster in a hotel or restaurant. I used to visit the area around the island regularly during the winter months as a child. But according to local legend, it is the beating heart of a tanifa, an ogre called Mato, that causes the lake's respirations. Matakori, the hero of this particular myth, set alight the ogre whilst he slept in order to rescue his beloved Manata, the beautiful daughter of a local chief whom the tanifa had kidnapped. And as Mato burned, he left behind his heart, which continued to beat rhythmically, regularly, evenly, in the years that followed Matakori's daring rescue. Now, the brilliance of this myth is its accuracy. It underscores not only the geographical knowledge of the local indigenous peoples, uh, when seen above, I think the shape of the lake looks like a sleeping giant, but it also recognizes their scientific expertise for the lake really does rise and fall, rise and fall regularly throughout the day. Despite being landlocked, the lake has an observable tide known as a seish or a standing wave that occurs every 26.7 minutes and results in a tide that rises and falls almost eight inches. Of course, the seish is the Western scientific explanation for the lake's regular aquatic behavior. The lake breathes because Mato's heart is still beating. Whakatoki, uh, 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 Whaka, uh, Whaka, Whaka, Whakatipu's origin myths uh, proposes a respiration that is wonderfully metaphorical and scientific, but it also raises uh, questions about the conditions, anthropomorphism, and embodiments of breath itself. Namely, I'm curious here who is an agent of breath, who and what breathes, who can breathe easily in the Anthropocene, who can breathe easily at all. And yet, what an unnecessarily vexed and cruel question this is when so many people nowadays cannot breathe fluently or joyfully in a global pandemic. Over the course of last year, the ventilator has become a vexed symbol of the medical injustice or medical persistence of life, of political incompetence, of medicalized racial injustice. And the lungs that strain against COVID-19 virus are often the same lungs that have historically struggled against anthropogenic non-viral forms of air pollution. COVID-19, like industrial air pollutants, is an indicator of systemic racism, imperialism and colonialism and the uneven urban developments of risk. Indeed, in December of last year, a British coroner ruled for the first time in legal history of the United Kingdom that emissions of nitrogen dioxide, in particular matter on the South Circular Road of London, were the cause of nine-year-old Ella Cassie Deborah's acute respiratory failure in February 2013. Toxic airborne pollution is vile matter that forcibly connects bodies with their racialized environments. And as Timothy Choi notes, air muddies the distinction between subjects and environments and between subjects. This thickness and porosity rendered by air is part of what makes the air and the airborne such deeply felt elements. We as human animals are porous, enabling toxic air to fill the softness of our lungs. We feel the acute intimacy of pollutants within our bodies. What makes Ella Kissy Debra's case so tragic is its familiarity. Non-Hispanic Black and African-American populations are especially vulnerable to asthma as city planners have historically zoned high traffic routes, crude oil refineries and waste industries in minoritized communities. Toxic airborne particulates and systemic racism precipitate together and jointly problematize the difficulty of breathing. And if we extend this train of thought, the numerous instances of police brutality and institutionalized violence, which saw Eric Garner utter his last words, I can't breathe, we realize the stakes of breathing are in the acts of a desire to recognize one's life and liberty. To breathe freely is to have humanity recognized. We know the matter of the air by the smoothness of respirations. We feel the keen politics of the air when breathing is labored. So I can point to numerous examples where respiration in the context of human life is fraught, contested and dangerous. Indeed, the act of breathing foregrounds the buoyancy of humanity and humility, inviting questions 
about who is afforded civil rights and the right to a kind life and to empathy. And as I proceed with this talk, I, I want to acknowledge and hold those complexities, breathing in relation to human life, especially for populations of color, for disabled people, for transgender communities, is not yet guaranteed. And I want to consider additionally who and what has been excluded from the discourses of breathing more generally, and how breathing itself has been anthropomorphized at the expense of other forms of life and other environments. So in this talk then I want to attend to the more than human world to our global infrastructures enabled by fossil fuels and industry and to consider our entanglements with oil, with carbon and with non-human life forms who are alien to our ways of breathing. As Jane Bennett suggests, humans are always in composition with non-humanity, never outside of a sticky web of connections or an ecology. Indeed, we share the act of breathing with the non-human, with the non-human, human animal and non-human animal entanglements collapse the nature and culture divide, revealing the arbitrariness of these very distinctions and foreground the meshing of strange modes of breathing with environments and their actors. This much is known. Indeed, it is worth renegotiating the nature culture binaries at play and instead reimagine not the intersections between life forms, but rather how species marvelously mesh with microbes, flora and fauna, the local, the regional and the cellular under the shared global atmosphere in which we all collectively respire. This rhetorical resistance to the nature culture division requires a shift in thinking about breath itself outside of human modes of breathing. So here I'm interested in other kinds of strange breath making and breathing events that do not map onto our normative perceptions of respiration. After all, what is breath for entities and agents like Lake Wakatipu? How might a breathing lake reshape our understanding of agentic and non-agentic actors of breathing? What breathes? What can breathe differently? What emits gas that spills into our atmosphere, which we then in turn inhale? So Sasha Engelman frames this question more eloquently than I do here, for she suggests the question who is not a breather is an open-ended provocation to think of a politics in terms of the atmospheric and the more than human. Under a global atmosphere lies multiple breathing worlds that are peculiar to different species, life forms and environments. And if Lake Wakatipu is a breather and itself imagines a breathing world, what queer politics of the body must we nurture? What rights must we afford to it or to Mato, whose absent body now defines the body of the lake and whose violent death exemplifies the very mattering of my childhood? From the moment of our emergence, none of us can unlearn breathing. But if we think of a respiration outside of the human body and in relation to environments and to environmental actors and non-actors, we re-interrogate the very motions of inhalation and exhalation that are wonderfully alien, strange and antithetical to our notions of air and our experiences of embodiment and indeed of the atmosphere. If animals, plants, humans, lakes, waters, soils, buildings, roads, refineries, trees, forests and meadows experience some form of respiration as a gas exchange, why is it that breathing is typically represented as a human affair? More specifically, why are our human lungs so often framed as the hub for our experience of respiration when respiration happens all around us? The personification of nature's breathing as quasi-human gives me pause for it virtualizes, obfuscates other forms of respiration that are worthy of inquiry. And if we shift our perspective slightly, we might decenter the human as the global protagonist of breathing whose breathing world overcomes all others. Indeed, when scholars point to what they call the ocean of air to describe the atmosphere, they do so in a way that renders the atmosphere as earthbound, liquid and horizontal, which in turn ties breathing to human forms of able embodiment and our experiences of horizontality. After all, we too are a moist species, our breathing is often wet. So what is breathing without the human body? What is breathing without the head? 
So I raise these questions because I want to understand the anthropomorphism of breath in order to attend to respiration itself as a mode of gas exchange and to consider Irish artist John Gerard's representations of smoke, which have confronted the eligibility of the atmosphere and Western fantasies of carbon culture. I was certainly percolating these ideas when I examined first his 2006 virtual sculpture, Smoke Trees, and his 2013 virtual sculpture, Burning Oil Fields, which is currently on display at the Gund Gallery. So I'm going to discuss Burning Oil Fields later in this talk, but for now I want to pause and attend to this earlier work, Smoke Trees, as a precursor to understanding the latter. Smoke Trees is a series of six hyperrealistic virtual sculptures where the leaves of a tree have been replaced with wisps of smoke that give the appearance that the tree is exhaling carbon. Now I'm showing a still from the sculpture on the screen, but it is a real time work in motion. So for context, John Girard's later virtual sculptures are extraordinarily lifelike. Now I'll admit that when I first saw one of Girard's works and installation and virtual sculpture called Western Flag, I honestly thought that I was witnessing a real time live action video. In fact, his works are simulations of emissions, meaning that the indexical bond that is the referent of the sculpture to a specific living and real object is actually absent. A smoke tree is the name of the Cotinus cogugria scop, a type of plant native to Southern Europe, Central Asia and China, and whose magnificent purple plumes have the appearance of wisps of smoke. But the sculpture smoke trees is not an index of a specific tree or even the specific species. Rather, these virtual sculptures are based on the memory of trees such as ash and oak that populated Gerard's childhood in Tipperary, Ireland. This indexical distance between the smoke sculptures and the representation of memory underlie the uncanniness of these smoke trees. Although unlike his later sculptures like Western Flag, it is very clear that the series, however hyperreal, is a simulation. The pasture in the sculpture is devoid of non-human animal and human animal life forms, although there is a tree line clearly visible in the distance and the landscape is an overtly manufactured one. These are clear traces of human clearings. We can't fully credit Girard for his invention of what he calls smoke sculptures or virtual sculptures. Fascist writer Giovanni Papini proposes their creation in his satirical pseudo memoir, Gog, where the titular character visits a sculptor by the name of Mataiga, who creates these wonderful smoke sculptures of a human figure. Mataiga's sculpture is an ephemeral one for it quickly disperses as a phantom losing its outline and melting away in a gray mist. But Girard's smoke sculptures defy human forms and foreground the persistence of digital materiality that render legible the illegibility of air. And this is my favorite quote that I repeat often, but I really do feel that it's pertinent because Eva Horn has argued we only notice the air through its disruption. And disruptions like smog, smoke, and weather activity bring to light the atmosphere as a carrier, a pattern maker, and an extraterrestrial cultural space. In smoke trees, the image of a tree emitting carbon disrupts not only our familiarity with the air, but it also disturbs our perception of plant-based respiration. Tree respiration involves a gas exchange whereby stomata, the, the tiny pores on a tree's leaf, open and close, drawing in carbon dioxide, which in conjunction with photosynthesis is needed to produce energy. Carbon is typically locked in a plant's biomass and oxygen and water vapor too are released during respiration and transpiration. So it's true that trees don't breathe in the same manner that we do, but the purposefulness of their breathing event remains the same because plant respiration, like human respiration, enables persistence and self-maintenance within complex environments. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Trees also do, re do release carbon dioxide but, John, but Gerard's uh, sculpture relies on reversing the pervasive symbolism of the tree as an actor who contributes to the planet's oxygen economy. Indeed, the, tree, the idea that trees could be active pollutants is a perverse but also thrilling one. Could trees be agents of risk, exhaling smoke and contributing to our global carbon budgets? In fact, in an interview, Gerard describes his smoke trees as a kind of polluter, a bit like we are polluters. 
So smart trees, I believe, imagines a time, however real or impossible, where trees can no longer absorb the amount of carbon we release into the atmosphere. While the sculpture suggests a fundamental misunderstanding of tree respiration, this misunderstanding is not the point because, as I said, the sculpture has no indexical bond with a real tree. Rather, smoke trees is a political sculpture, even if its politics remains somewhat ambiguous. After all, the sculpture portrays none of the ecological anxiety that street artists like Will Ferreira portrays in his work, Man Breathing from the Last Tree on Earth, in which we're presented with a figurine apparently inhaling through a gas mask tube the last drops of oxygen produced from a domed tree. Still, smoke trees is very unsettling, one that reverses these expectations of respiration and perception. So what point is Gerard making here? Well, I want to return to my earlier comments about anthropomorphism and the idea that lungs are the matter of respiration that matters, at least from our human perspective. Wild forests are frequently spoken in the context of this human embodiment. Consider, for example, the representation of the Amazon rainforest as the lungs of the planet in various media broadcasts over the course of last year. As vexed a symbol the Amazon is as our planetary lungs, it is often accompanied by the misleading claim that this rainforest produces 20% of the world's oxygen supply. Actually, its contribution is somewhere around zero, and destroying all the forests in the world wouldn't necessarily eliminate a global supply of oxygen, at least not according to biochemist Nick Lane. Instead, we should really be attending to the significance of oceanic phytoplankton as global oxygenators. Still, the trees as lungs trope through though really gestures to the displacement of our anxious embodiment and our own sense of fragility in an ecologically changing world under threat by governments and transnational industry. Reports of anthropogenic wildfires have provoked substantial social anxiety about the seemingly out of control deforestation in Brazil, in addition to the forest fire events in California and Australia in 2019 and 2020. According to the Brazil's National Institute for Space Research, uh, President Jair Bolsonaro's relaxation of environmental regulations combined with political encouragement to increase agricultural activity saw over 700 square miles of forests cleared between April and June 2019. This rampant deforestation marked an increase of 25% from the same period the year before. And forests are enormous carbon sinks, and any forest fire like those in California, Australia, and Brazil produce thick, monstrous plumes into the atmosphere. Indeed, in January 2020, for example, NASA scientists followed the long journey of particulates and aerosols from the Australian bushfires as they skirted over Aotearoa, New Zealand, before crisscrossing the ocean to South America, where the skies and sunset turned hazy and beautiful. The smoke made a full circuit around the globe before it returned to its place of origin in Australia. More between December 2019 and January 4th, 2020, the Australian wildfires produced at least 18 pyrocumulonimbus clouds as they migrated across the entire span of the globe. Forest fire smoke is the imperfect lesson of the social construction of atmospheres between eligibility and visibility and the mobility of aerosolized landscapes beyond their points of origin. As wildfire generated particulates from Australia, California and Brazil traveled beyond the confines of sovereign and state territories, the vapors interconnectivity between landscapes became especially inflammatory in asthmatic lungs. Perhaps this environmental interconnectivity disturbs our sense of national belonging when a piece of Australia can be so easily inhaled by a New Zealander on the east coast of Aotearoa. What is the point of national boundaries when trees can be vaporized by fire and migrate the world as smoke? And the danger of smoke lies not only in its carcinogenic particulates, but also the fact that it moves and can affect people far from it, the point of, its point of origin. Even in February 2020, for example, New Zealanders with respiratory issues were advised to remain indoors as the afterplumes of wildfire smoke from Australia continued to drift into our national airspace. Airborne carbon pollution then thinks us, invites us to think more about our spatial interconnectivity, our atmospheric citizenship, global air circulations, and our global embodiments. In other words, in 2020, as in 2019, we knew smoke through its movements and global distributions. 
There's something tantalizing familiar, strangely human with the idea that a tree is lungful, that forests like the Amazon are people, and by the power of personification, we have a responsibility to the preservation of their perceived humanity, but not necessarily the preservation of the humanity of indigenous peoples living within them. So I want to take pains to emphasize that I'm not suggesting that the Amazon is not a significant environment. It is, it quite frankly, it is. Our global forests are. But this leads me back to Gerard's virtual installation, or virtual sculpture, Smoke Trees, because on the one hand, I read this sculpture as a political comment on deforestation, even though this work was produced in 2006. I mean, notice, for example, that this tree is the only smoking tree in its manufactured pastoral landscape. And the context of global, uh, global deforestation feels very relevant to this work. Secondly, I wonder to what extent the sculpture invites us to think with plants like plants or plant like, given the connection that Gerard is making between humans and trees as co polluters in his, in his interview. Michael Mada, in fact, makes a curious connection to breath and plants when he proposes that plant thinking refers in the same breath to the non-cognitive, non-ideational and non-imagistic mode of thinking proper to plants, hence what I call thinking without a head. As you see, he articulates an additional three points to his definition, but I'm gonna focus on just the first here in order to run with plant thinking in relation to smoke trees. But I also want to adapt Marta's first point here to consider smoke trees as an example of breathing without the head, or more accurately, breathing without lungs. If smoke trees is inviting us into a breathing world without us, but in relation to us, then we can read this work as a comment on our breath's entanglement with trees and on a cultural imaginary in which pollution and breath is an event of risk available to all life forms with and without lungs and with environments. Yet the value that I see in smoke trees is how it speculates on the virtuality of air and other kinds of breathing in a virtual format. And so the question that I'm proposing today is what would it mean to consider respiration as a primary global phenomena shared by different species and environments and through different mechanisms? After all, what is respiration without lungs, but with gills like fish or skin like frogs? What if we breathe through our buttocks like turtles? What about microbes, gnats, and flies? How might we understand floral respirations like those of lilies, roses, weeds, thistles? What about moss? How might we imagine breath and breathing in the context of our global infrastructures and transnational industries like oil, petroleum, and agriculture on which mass deforestation is vital? How might we see breathing events in a strange and marvelous more than human way to network ourselves with other environments and decenter our own peculiar lungs is the primary mode of breathing on this weird planet. What would it mean to see breath as truly common and networked, as planetary? To see breath as a world-making planetary activity invites pushing for different edges and surfaces of breath and breath making and removing it from the propriety of human value judgments. Smoke trees, for example, isn't arguing against carbon pollution, although I do believe that we can read it in the context of deforestation as I am here. Rather, it proposes that emissions are breathing events that happen with and without anthropogenic actions. And it suggests too that we should attend carefully to the infrastructural contexts that make respiratory failures possible. And this leads me to Gerard's 2013 virtual smoke sculpture, Burning Oil Fields, which is currently on display at the Gund Gallery. The full title of this work is Burning Oil Fields near Abadan, Iran. And the sculpture has a 360 degree slow pan that reveals a landscape devoid of presence, the presence of human life. But what we witness instead are the infrastructures of human civilization. As the sculpture pans, we witness the markings of our presence, above ground voltage wires, a shed, a flat paved road that disappears into the distance. And on the horizon are 13 plumes of black smoke that spew into the gray sky. Now in the description of the work, Courtney Johnson wrote this really wonderful copy that I want to repeat here because I think they're absolutely correct in their observation. Gerard's burning oil fields, they write, slowly introduces viewers to a set of wispy smoke curls that expand into the plumes against an otherwise black landscape, uh, black landscape apparently like a mirage of distant trees. 
So I really love this description because I immediately thought of the work's connection to Girard's earlier sculpture, Smoke Trees, and its distant tree line. How odd that these plumes of smoke ought to gesture to a forest and to smoking trees. So what kind of connections could this work draw toward the relentless forest fires in California and Brazil and the bushfires in Australia? Read in this light, well, uh, burning oil fields underscores the perversion of the pastoral, much like smoking trees does, where the idea of the agricultural field is replaced with another kind of crude field in which the oil industry is the main focus of human endeavors. Actually, even as burning oil fields makes these claims, it also gestures to the historical infrastructures of the petroleum industry and the charged political fields in which major petroleum actors such as BP have fostered and ruptured and made breathing difficult on a global scale. So for context, Abadan lies on the, east, on, the, on the coast of the Persian Gulf and it is the site of rich oil fields in Iran. The Abadan refinery was built uh, by the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, uh, later called BP in 1912. And for a while, it was the largest or one of the largest refineries in the world. In 1951, the refinery was nationalized, which then prompted a coup d'etat orchestrated by the British intelligence, intelligence agency M16 and the American intelligence agency CIA. And this transnational interference subsequently saw the overthrow of the democratically elected prime minister. But significant for my reading here are the events of the 1980 Iran-Iraq war, during which time the city of Abadan was besieged, although never captured by the Iraqi army. The Abadan refinery, however, was more or less destroyed during the intense uh, fighting in September 20, 1980. And it, later, it was later rebuilt following the war's conclusion. Nowadays, the refinery is a symbol of a global petroculture, a petro empire that spans from east to west. Indeed, in 2017, Sinopec, the China Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, signed a contract deal worth $1 billion to overhaul and expand the aging facility. So this historical context uh, certainly frames the sculpture burning oil fields, but it would be remiss not to acknowledge the photograph of the Iraqi siege on the Abadan refinery on which this virtual sculpture is actually based. Uh, like smoke trees, burning oil fields is a virtual sculpture, in this case, a virtual memory. And in this case, the sculpture is based on a photograph by Henri Bureau, who captured this award-winning image of an Iranian soldier overlooking the burning oil fields. Bureau would later describe this image of the first oil war in the context of his own struggles to capture the social eligibility of an environmental disaster. In fact, he would write, the spectacle is dantesque. The flames are enormous. The ground trembles underfoot. It's the end of the day, the wind blowing, the smoke over our heads lets the last rays of the setting sun pass low to the ground. It's grandiose and I don't know how to go about rendering what I see. Burning oil fields encapsulates the display of petro-nationalism and resource extraction that gestures toward our global entanglements with fossil fuels. Although unlike Bureau's photo, which captures Dante's housecape of fire, Girard's sculpture is more muted, more distant, the landscape and smoke plumes seemingly more remote and contained. Bureau's image of the burning refinery invites us to connect with the thick plumes in the background with the military space of the foreground, the soldier, his back turned to us stages the frame in which we form maybe not necessarily camaraderie, but certainly a connection with the soldier while we both observe the spectacle of the disaster. Our gaze is certainly meshed with the soldier as we watch the symbolic catastrophe of the Middle Eastern oil industry on fire. Yet Girard's sculpture pushes against making such easy connections. Gone is the soldier in his work, but what remains is what's absent in Bureau's photograph, the infrastructures of modernity that make the oil industry possible in the first place. The foreground background composition that is so significant in Bureau's photograph is replaced with the 360 degree pan that curates the historically vaporous infrastructures of an oil-based modernity and the deep cuts, the environmental burdens they impose on fragile temporary landscapes. The Iran-Iraq war is elided, it's displaced, but the infrastructures that it destroyed are globalized within the space of the pan. 
So Stephanie Lemanage describes our contemporary moment as a petro-utopia, but I think both Bureau's photograph and Sherard's virtual sculpture underscored the failed fantasies that the crude oil industry fosters. What we're left with instead are the petroleum nightmares that choke the atmosphere with thick plumes of carbon. Elsewhere, I've argued that Gerard's sculptures are miasmatic, but not in the historical sense of the word. Miasma, the ancient Greek word for pollution, is an antiquated medical term that clay claimed inhaled bad air or odorous airborne particulates were responsible for ill health before germ theory gained traction in the 19th century. Yet modern bad air isn't the rotting organic particulates that once steeped 19th century urban rivers but the formless condition of modern polluting industries that impose their catastrophic presence on local environments. But Girard's virtual sculpture, Burning Oil Fields, is not only bad air, it's also bad breath. His portrayals of the muted plumes, or more muted plumes, of smoke is what leaves us breathless from the culture of oil extraction, which makes our modern society possible and which contributed to nine-year-old Ella Kissy Debra's respiratory failure in the year that the sculpture was made. This invisibility of infrastructure makes it difficult for us to see the proverbial wood from the trees, which is why the slow pan of burning oil fields highlights the surrounding infrastructures of the Abadan refinery, that is the road, the shed, the voltage wires, while the smoke in the background remains more distant to us. Earlier, I mentioned that respiration as a gas exchange is what allows life forms to persist and regulate self-maintenance in complex environments. And I do believe that this is correct, but burning oil fields also underscores the limits of our self-maintenance by foregrounding a respiration that emerges from the choking presence of a global petroleum infrastructure and their transportation networks. It's really hard not to uh, apprehend Gerard's artworks as a comment on global warming when the burning of fossil fuels and forests have been a major contributor. And the similarities between smoke trees and burning oil fields thus proposes a kind of bad air of climate truth that chokes us on a planetary respiratory scale, especially as we experience with increasing frequency the effects of weather disturbances. And quite frankly, none of us can breathe easily right now. When I say planetary respiration, I'm not suggesting that the Earth is a sentient Gaia. But I am proposing that we think more globally in terms of our connections with breath as an event that migrates across temporalities and environments. Because doing so not only means attending to how the burning of the uh, doing so means not only attending to how the burning of the Abadan refinery affected the respirations of local soldiers, but it's also, but also it's broader ramifications for the global oil industry and global environments, even in 2021. So I'm really conscious that throughout this talk, I have slipped in and out of the cruelty, what I think is the cruelty of metaphor. There are rhetorical moves relating to breath between smoke trees and burning oil fields with which I grapple. After all, can we truly call a burning oil refinery that darkens the sky with sooty smoke an example of respiration? Certainly, I find myself straining to resist this framing as a useful comparison when I think of breath in the context of burning oil refineries, deforestation, or lakes like Wakatipu, a lake that is itself at risk from climate change. But last week at a talk on uh, poetry and plants hosted by Davy Nittle at the Kelly Writers House, poet Evelyn Riley made a really wonderful comment that metaphor is how we think. And I love this comment. Um, and it is in this moment of carbon-based respiration that I really encourage us to embrace breathing as a metaphor, as a device, a technology with which to apprehend the landscapes like Abadan, or the Amazon rainforests that are in full explosion of their emissions. And that's the value of the metaphor of breath under climactic ecological pressure to which I gesture in John Gerard's sculptures, smoke trees and burning oil fields. Breathing helps us to think through our exchanges with carbon-based industries. Indeed, at stake is the catastrophe of climate change, its elemental risks and its everyday violence that inflames our lungs and calls our bodies to action. Because right now, none of us can afford to hold our breath. Thank you.
Thank you, Orchid. That was really, really compelling. I appreciate all of your um, you sharing your your research and your insight into this. Um, well, both of John Gerard's virtual sculptures. And so thank you very much for that. Um, for the audience, if you have questions, Orchid said she would welcome them. We can take some time to do that now. I know that there are some scientists here, so I would love to be able to, um, <laughs> to talk to um, Siobhan, Siobhan actually at some point about um, plants and plant breathing, because at some point I would like to sort of- I, I would more. love that. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was, it was fascinating. And just the threads that you wove together um, and the insight into the, the different pieces and your take and your wisdom on that. Um, yeah, I would love to talk about that sometime. I think the metaphor works really well. Um, and just the mechanics of, plant respiration and how that, you know, feeds into your, your sort of narrative there, so. Um, uh, I, hi, I have a question for you, Orchid. Yeah. Uh, it's Evelyn. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm eating lunch, so I'm not <laughs> sharing that with all of you visually. But um, yeah, thanks for that talk. Just very smart and uh, very interesting. And I just had one question about maybe just a different part of it is yeah. that, um, you know, his work has great beauty. Yeah. And it's even pastoralized in a certain way, you know, even having the soldier out. Although that photograph also had a kind of beauty. And I was just wondering in the context of art and poetry, you know, this, it's something I've worried about, this putting together a call to action, beauty, aestheticizing. It's kind of about our endeavor as artists engaged with environmental topics. I don't have any answer, but I was struck by the beauty of his work. And I just wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you mentioned that because I was thinking about that last night. Is I mean, isn't this sort of like the, the struggle that we have as um, environmental poets and artists and writers is how do we manage the the lacuna between the aestheticization and the um the violence that is getting portrayed um i don't have any easy answers to that you're right his work is really i mean it's mesmerizing when i went to the gun gallery to to look at this work and i was just i just sat there just absorbing it and i feel like there's sort of I mean, I suppose we could sort of say something about the politics of absorption um, and how we should be resisting that absorption. Um, but how do we, how do we, how, um, and I would love to sort of talk more about this as to, particularly from, from, from an art historian perspective is how do we, how do we grapple with the, the aestheticization of what essentially is extreme violence that is affecting predominantly at least with climate change that is affecting people in the Pacific, um, people of color in, um, on a horrific level. Um, that's a sort of non-answer to your question. And I, 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 the other thing is, is that is, is Jean Girard's work simply raising awareness or is it doing something more? And I mean, that's also something that I think comes up with this question, um, with this aestheticization. Um, I don't know. That's a really great question. And one thing that I'm sort of certainly grappling with in the context of this work. There's beauty and violence. Someone just put here. in the chat the term, the to toxic. Yeah. Someone just put in the chat the term toxic sublime. And I think sublime helps because of that mixture of awe, terror, wonder, fear. Yeah, there's something about the remapping of the sublime in our current era, which is a good thing to think about, maybe. Yeah, and also not just against. Um, I see Jill also has a hand up, but I just sort of say I'm. I'm just you know necropastoral to think about McSweeney's um, might also be another way of sort of managing that kind of the toxic sublime, or um, um, in relation to these kinds of these kinds of environments. 
I, I had a question. First of all, thank you. I, I loved your ability to bring in this topic through the art um, in such an engaging way. And I'm particularly interested for those of us who don't have the benefit of being in the gallery um, about you know, this idea of sculpture, but in a very new medium of sculpture. And when you were just saying about um, sort of the beauty, but also how he engages with the environment, I find very interesting because obviously it's relevant to the topic too. I, I would love, yeah, no, that's a great question because it's like what makes these works um, he, he calls them virtual sculptures, but also smoke sculptures in various um, parts. And I'm very curious as to what makes these um, sculptural, but it does seem sense in the sense that I understand it, that, you know, sculptures, and what he's doing is, is mediating a landscape that doesn't exist um, or exists already in another form in a virtual, virtual manner. So smoke trees is a memory. Um, the um, uh, burning oil fields is based on a photograph, which again is a mediation. So there's constant remediations that's happening here. And I'm trying to sort of, I would actually, you know, as I proceed with this, one thing that I would like to do is learn more about, <laughs> about sculpture and, and theory of sculpture in relationship to representations or mimesis. I mean, these aren't sort of clear, um, there's no indexical bond, um, but what makes, why, why are these framed as sculptures and not films? Um, um, what, what is the rhetorical move that that particular framework is doing? And is that gesturing to a different kind of uh, value of remediation that perhaps cinematic, cinematically um, is not, it doesn't do? Um, these are also made in terms of collaboration as well with other people. So there is a sort of like um, um, digital rendering um, team that's going behind with the scene to create these to create these kinds of sculptures, but I am kind of curious as to which often with traditional sculpture they are made with teams of people yeah. and sort yeah. of there. I just find it interesting because sculpture in general is a reduction or an additive process. Yeah, when you think of the topic you're talking about, the climate change or you know the changing landscape it's fascinating i think so thank you for tying his work to all of this i really appreciated it no thank you for that question i'm sort of th thinking more percolating more about those kinds of those kinds of questions i think thomas has a question yes hi orkin thank you very much uh, for the presentation um i like jill am not in uh, Gambier, and I um, haven't been able to walk into um, to see the um, the exhibit, but I, I think I heard you say that in the exhibit these are films. There's motion. It's motion, the... yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's pa uh, it pans from I think from right to left, if I recall correctly. Is that right, Jill? Uh, oh, it's like a pan and scan, or is the smoke moving? No, it's so the smoke is moving, but the camera, like the ca the perspective, is also shifting. I believe it's from right to okay. left. Okay. I. That's yeah. That's correct. That's right. And it, it, it moves was, really slowly. It moves very very slowly. Yeah. I was at the the Met in New York. I don't know how many years ago, actually, but they had this, I wonder if John did this, but you'd go up to the roof, I think it was at noon every day for about six weeks, and this black cloud would be created and you'd want, you know, went a different direction, I guess, every, every day and eventually uh, dissipated. Do, are you aware of him ever doing anything live? <laughs> like, like what I've just described? Uh, so he has, he, with, uh, with the, he has this sculptural, virtual sculpture installation called Western Flag, um, which is again, a sort of like projection of video projection of this flag that is literally, well, not a flag, but it's, um, that is, um, um, emitting sort of like carbon 
um, into the atmosphere and that moves, but he's actually staged that in different environments. Like there's one that's, he staged at Spindletop, um, the oil, the former oil um, field um, in Texas. It's been in, I think in Colorado, Arizona, or elsewhere. So, but, but, but I'm really kind of fascinated by this idea of, because that seems like very much like a smoke sculpture as, uh, as um, Giovanni um, Papini um, describes them. Right. Yeah, this thing I saw, it would create, what it created every day was about the same. It was this very, it was about six feet wide initially and very tight smoke. Wow. <laughs> and it was, it was very interesting. This, well, thank you. No, no, thank you. That's that. There are a lot of like, um, uh, you know, artists who have tried to explore this idea of smoke or clouds. Um, I forget the name of the. There's a permanent cloud installation um, or fog installation um, in Australia, one of the Australian um, um, uh, museums. But um, there is a sort of like ephemerality. The, the the thing is, is that these, you know, these kinds of smoke sculptures um, that you're describing they are ephemeral they're not meant to you know they, they there's a weird persistence um in yeah. their ephemerality whereas this and they didn't keep it forever it was yeah. like a run and i was i don't live in new york so i was really only able to go once maybe twice and it looked pretty pretty similar but it was days very close together so oh, that's interesting yeah, I mean, um, I mean, Andy Warhol also did something. He did a, it's like his silver clouds, um, which were actually balloons. But um, well, a, I'm I'm from Pittsburgh, and I'm a oh, Carnegie no. graduate too, so I know a lot about. Yeah, no, <laughs> see, <laughs> I think that I think that installation is permanent there in the Andy Warhol. The balloons, yes, yeah. and until they get shabby, and then they make new balloons and fill yeah. back. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if, yeah. if we don't have any more questions, I think we can we can wrap it up here. It's almost Listen. one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to my thank you. final thoughts. <laughs> yeah, thank you for bringing this work to light for us, Orchid. No, thank you. Thank you for hosting Jean Girard's work. I'm so super excited that you got you got it. We are too. <laughs> 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 thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank you.